doing business in Africa. You can't afford to be without Africa Investor. Back today is day two of the second intra-African trade fair uh, taking place in Durban. Uh, the seven-day event gives traders a chance to claim their piece of the African market pie. But what does it take? Let's take a look uh, at some uh, of the uh, conversations. We're joined now by the chair of the Africa Investor, Hubert Danso, uh, together with the executive director for marketing and communications at the University of Limpopo, Vita Homoswana. He's also the author of a book, Africa is Open for business. A very good morning to both of you gentlemen. Victor, what is the importance of the Africa uh, intra-African trade fair? Good morning to you Desiree and to, to Hubert. The importance is a no-brainer. We know at the moment we are trading, the total trade in Africa is under 20% happening or taking place between intra-African, well, in the, in, among African countries. The only way to develop wealth and take advantage of the billion plus Africans on the continent, especially after the signing of the Africa Continental Free Trade Area, is to increase the volume of trade to the current 16% to at least 40%, Desiree, because we know that the European Union the Asian regions, all the leading regions of the world economically have a higher level of intra-regional trade. And that's the only way that Africa is going to be able to grow. That way we can drive up industrialization, we can drive up the beneficiation of the rich mineral resources that we have. We can also break the barriers, the socio-cultural barriers that are continuing to divide Africa, thereby leaving it prone to exploitation of all kinds. Hubert Danso, how will the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement regulations help stimulate this anticipated trade among Af amongst African countries? Thank you very much, uh, Desiree and, and viewers. And I think as Victor sort of alluded to, the, 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 there's a very powerful platform that we have as the continent called the African Continental Free Trade Area, which is designed to boost intra-African trade by about 52.3% uh, once import duties and non-tariff barriers are eliminated. Um, and we know that it's covering about a $3.4 trillion market. So those are, you know, some really important backstops. But when you think about it, you know, there are also some very important ongoing uh, negotiations that are going to be fundamental to accelerating the success and implementation for the African continental free trade area. We've got the investment protocol negotiation. We've got the intellectual property protocol negotiation. We've got the e-commerce and e-trade uh, negotiation. And I think this has basically arrived at a point where the continent compounded by a COVID reality, you know, having to look forward at the climate change dynamics has really, you know, put the African continental free trade area at the heart and center of being described as Africa's stimulus. And, and that's one of the reasons that we feel that private sector partnerships and the investment community coming together with governments is, is, is absolutely critical to actually realize that particular goal. We are not a, a part of the world that can throw five, ten trillion dollars at our economic recovery for our small and medium sized uh, enterprises. So we effectively established a program called Regulations as a Stimulus, which, com which completely uh, leverages and is, is a partnership with the African continental free trade area, which basically goes to show that, you know, with this particular approach, with this type of partnership, efficiencies created at the border can enhance businesses' revenue by about, in, on the continent, just businesses' revenue alone, by about $500 billion a year, which is 25% more than the World Bank estimates. And if you look at the optimistic estimates that consider intra-African trade um, will grow by, say, 5.7 to 8.7 billion in the long run, I mean, and, and as a consequence of the African continental free trade area, you know, our research shows that if we implement a regulation as a stimulus program, intra-African trade could be lifted by as much as $7.2 billion per annum. So this is a huge deal. This is not a big deal. This is a huge deal. This intra-African trade fair is coming together 
right in the middle of, uh, you know, the, the challenges around COVID, as I said, right at a time when we've just come off the back of Glasgow and everyone's now thinking about trade being one of the biggest contributors uh, towards uh, emissions, notwithstanding the fact that the African continental free trade area, you know, has been put together much quicker than any other global uh, regional trade agreement. It's the largest since the establishment of the African, uh, excuse me, of the World Trade Organization on a global basis. And this is the first convening of all of our key political trade leaders, the trade finance community, the investment community, and the small and medium-sized uh, uh, enterprises, the uh, creative industries, uh, and the youth, which are going to be critical to driving the success. Victor, how will the ambitions of all those traders uh, attending this event be affected by the outcomes of COP26 that's just ended in Glasgow? I, I would not worry too much because if you think about cop 26 that's a okay let's focus on coal for example if coal is is a, is a factor of discussion if you remember i mean african countries are not ready to go where cop 26 wants them to go with regard to removing coal and that's why you've heard about playing down or reducing the amount of coal emissions but i would not be too concerned about cop 26 I'll be concerned about whether the people attending this uh, the, the trade fair this year are setting tangible goals for themselves. Remember, nobody's going to ring the bell and say, now you may start trading with one another African countries. It is about them setting targets that as countries, as member countries, we are going to set targets for ourselves that when we come again next year to meet, we would have increased our own individual contribution as a member state by this percentage point. Otherwise, we are going to be in trouble. But of course, the global situation, Africa is not the largest contributor to carbon emissions anyway, Desiree. But we just have to make sure that whatever we do, we prioritize our own industrialization. We can hold our responsibility for environmental, well, environmental impact on the planet afterwards. I'm sorry to say, but we have to prioritize the industrialization of Africa. Luckily, Desiree, the drivers of economic growth in Africa also in include sectors that are not particularly having a high carbon footprint. We talk about fintech. We talk about retail consumer products, but we also talk about mobile telecommunications driven kind of growth. So it's not as if we're going to be particularly worried about that. I, Tourism I is another major mega industry on the African continent. Yeah, I'd just like to come in there, um, you know, just to support what Victor was saying. I was in Glasgow for these negotiations. And, you know, when you when you really look at the challenge, um, you know, from climate change, as, as Victor mentioned, three only three to four percent of the cumulative emissions globally come from Africa. And if you look at our proven fossil fuel reserves, we're talking about 15.2 trillion. That's what we have as value that we were going to be using for our economic growth. So really focusing on a just transition is a, is, is a very critical thing. But here's an interesting point that came out of it. And we had a very big meeting with the heads of the African continental free trade area, major global investors. And there's a big elephant in the room. Not only is it the just transition, which I call the elephant in the Paris Agreement text, but there's also this issue of scope one, scope two, scope three emissions. Scope one, in my company, how can I reduce the emissions? Scope two, how can I reduce the emissions within my supply chain? And then you've got this uh, amorphous scope three, which basically says, how can I reduce the emissions across the corporate value chain and the wider ecosystem, even with people that we don't do business with? So it's become very clear to negotiators that the African continental free trade area is an excellent platform if it's got the right legal and regulatory framework to mobilize some of the trillions of dollars of climate finance that are looking for a very productive home and to support the type of growth that we will be demonstrating and delivering uh, on the continent. So there's a real relationship between the way that the African continental free trade area can leverage scope three investments so that we can invest in that trade enabling supply chain logistics, fintech infrastructure that's going to prepare us and make us you know drive this green transition faster than most uh, oecd countries because of the low base of industrialization that we're at at the moment so it's exciting times we can we really need to join our post-pandemic economic recovery plan with our uh, you know aspirations and opportunities around climate change and also understand that 
you know, we've only just got going. This is a generational project. Let's not have too many outside voices coming and asking us what have you achieved in a time period that they would never have been able to achieve that themselves. We've got a steady ship. Our leaders are right now in Durban. We're here. We're working. We're driving this forward. And we've got women and we've got youth right front and center of this that are going to drive and transform our, our, our economic prospects and opportunity going forward. From what both of you are saying, clearly there's a lot of work going ahead. Uh, the uh, Secretariat of uh, the Trade Agreement released a document called The Challenges to Intra-African Trade, where they mentioned things such as limited GDPs and uh, small populations. Many small countries have small populations less than 20 million. How does this help us going forward, especially the traders attending this event who are looking at implementation of their ideas, but they need to have a clear understanding of the policy side and also of the operation side in terms of who they can talk to to get through to these African markets. Victor? The smaller economies that we have in terms of population are the very reason we need to drive intra-Africa trade. So if you are in Lesotho, or even in South Africa, by the way, we think of South Africa as a large country, but when you compare it to a Nigeria, it's a small economy. So I'm saying sometimes it's what countries can do, but sometimes, Desiree, it's what traders themselves can think of. I always preach that if you are doing business in any African country, stop thinking of your own country as the market. Start thinking of the entire billion plus Africans as your market. Because sometimes it's a matter of just getting across the border and finding customers and agents of distribution. It, it's almost as simple as that. And I know because I've, I've gone across the continent helping companies to find markets. Often the markets are there waiting for you to find them they will not come to you. So perhaps one of the liberating things that the Africa continental free trade area will do is that because the duties are going to continue to come down, it's up to the traders themselves to grab the bull by the proverbial horn and go across the borders. But most of all, they must start planning and thinking of their market as beyond their as, as, as geographic borders uh, take. Uh, I completely agree with Victor once again. Look, we have to see our domestic market as the entire African continent, and we have to see our international market as the rest of the globe. And, uh, and I think that's one of the big realizations that we're seeing. But the reality is also that there are some inequities and some discrimination that's historic that takes place in our trading system. And you know, we at the African Union Continental Business Network are working with global pension funds and sovereign wealth funds on what we describe as African continental free trade area supportive strategies. So what are we doing? We're working with companies and we're saying this whole issue of Africa exporting most of its value, we've described effectively as the biggest donor. We, we donate our natural resources so other countries can add value and become wealthy and prosper on the back of that. Now that needs to stop and that's what the African continental free trade area represents. So we're actually working with the major investors who are now asking their companies as part of their ESG programs, their environment, social and governance programs to say discrimination is a social issue, whether it be about women on boards, whether it be about the likes of the, the Black Lives Matter or all the historic things that we know uh, in, uh, continue to be unjust and, and were unjust. We're saying to the, we're, the investors are saying to the companies, Gentlemen. how much um, in, of your global value chain yeah. is African value added goods? But I'm and sorry, if you don't time have time that level, end. there's a challenge. Intra-African trade fair is going we, to address these. We're going to have to so, end we're going to have to end it there, but thank you so much for your time. Hubert Danso is the chair for Africa Investor, and Victor Homoswana is the executive director for marketing and communications at the University of Limpopo, having a conversation there about the intra-African trade fair that's currently underway in Wazulu Natal. Doing business in Africa, you can't afford to be without Africa Investor.